Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, our, our kaumatu and kuia and uh, our, our, our matua that are here tonight uh, our, and our kuia, uh, matua whatarangi, and, um, and to the, uh, the uh, organisers of the event. I'd like to acknowledge the J.R. McKenzie Trust, uh, Foundation North, Vodafone Foundation, uh, and all of you that are here tonight that have come from afar to Wananga to uh, explore how we as Indigenous peoples can think up our own solutions and the, for the prosperity of our, our communities and our people. So I just want to acknowledge you all from, from local, from close, from nearby and from afar. So uh, kia ora, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Lance O'Sullivan, as, as Mayhana kindly introduced me. Uh, I'm a doctor, and I, I wanted to contribute to the, to the conference by talking about uh, a, a, uh, an approach to democratise healthcare. You know, the, to put power, the power of healthcare into the, the, uh, the people's hands rather than to hands of... Um, in the hands of clinicians and, and doctors and nurses and health managers and hospitals and clinics. Rather, put it into the hands of the whānau and, you know, in, uh, of, of Ngāti Raukawa and of Tatai Tokero. And, um, and, uh, and so I want to talk about that. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about my background. Now, actually, I might try and get a sense for who's in the audience. Uh, so can, can you put your hands up if you're from overseas? Okay, so it's good, and uh, thank you. And can you put your hands up? Like I, I don't want to ruin it by boring everyone to death. So um, I wrote a book a, a couple of years ago, and it's always really bad when lots of people in the audience have read it because most of my speech is uh, based on that. So has anyone read my book? Okay, that's good. That's a good low number. <laughs> did you? Did we bring that truckload of books? Hey, all the royalties go to the Mukul Foundation. I just want to acknowledge our CEO, Deidre. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, quite, a, quite an awesome, uh, uh, us awesome uh, feedback I've had about Deidre. Actually, I follow in Deidre's footsteps in most places. And, oh, geez, these, uh, these uh, footsteps, are, these shoes are, are, are big ones to fill. Um, okay, good. So I'm happy that there's some international people here. We'll know bugger all about me, and uh, and there's uh, and there's a whole heap of people that haven't read my book, and that's awesome. So, yeah, I'm really really proud to be here <coughs> this evening as a a proud Maori man, a proud Maori clinician, and just to acknowledge my uh, colleague Reese uh, here tonight, Dr. Reese Jones. Um, and, uh, and uh, a, a proud uh, descendant of my tūpuna, of, of Ngāpuhi, Te Rārawa, uh, Ngāti Maruki Hauraki. But it's actually also quite unlikely that I would have been standing here a number of years ago. And uh, I want to talk about this. I haven't really got it on my, on my, my presentation, but just... Uh, the, the thoughts of uh, how I wanted to go this evening, it's, it's, earth, it's a story worth talking about. So it's, it was really unlikely that I would be standing here this evening uh, given where I'd come from. So I'm going to describe that to you uh, to um, give you a sense of, of why it's important we do what we do. So I... Um, so let me go... Let me see where I start. My father is Māori. Uh, I can give you all that whakapapa, but uh, he wātini ia no hauraki, i te taho toku kuia a māma no, no ngā roka o te tai tokurau me ngā rāpihana o te kainga. Um, so that's my whakapapa, my, my father's a wātini. He was one of 18 children, and uh, they lived in a place in, the, in New Zealand called the Coromandel, uh, and to us it's called hauraki. And, uh, and so they, they grew up, my father grew up with a lot of 
the, the, the issues that you, we all are, are fighting and raging against today, which is poverty, cultural dislocation, um, uh, and, the, and the, other, the, the, the fallout, the consequences of that, which is, you know, uh, substance abuse and violence and crime and those things. So uh, my, gra- my mother, on the, other, on the other hand, is an O'Sullivan, uh, and she's from a place called Timaru, uh, south of Christchurch. The story is my father was on a motorbike riding around the country and was working in freezing works, as many Māori did then in the 60s, and he, uh, he pulled up in Te Maru, and he met this um, Pākehā lady down there who was a rebel, um, raised from a middle-class Catholic farming family of South Canterbury, um, and hooked up with this, uh, this Māori man, and then, uh, then he whisked her back to the north. Now, uh, you know, this, this uh, story is, is, is cloaked in the, the uh, impact of colonisation, you know, this is uh, a family of 18 who, who's, who struggled to survive and struggled to, to, uh, to have enough food and have a warm home and, and be respected. And, you know, as Māori, as, when they were in a community that didn't view Māori as, as, as equal citizens. And, uh, and you know, my, uh, my aunties would tell me stories about going to school with... Um, with their clothes on that their mother had made, and her mother was very industrious and resourceful, and she had used some material that she, um, she had left lying around, and uh, they used to think that uh, the, the big champion sign on, her, on their dresses was a, um, a brand, a label, you know? And there is actually a champion label, I believe, and, uh, except this was uh, for flower bags. And um, so the aunties used to joke about the fact that they used to wear flower bags thinking it was, uh, you know, made into dresses, thinking they were, um, they were, uh, uh, it was a label. The uncles will tell me about, and uh, Uncle Leo, who lives up in Norake, and uh, he will talk about going to the butchers to get the dog bones, and that, you know, the dog bones weren't for the dogs, they were for the, the children. And, and actually, Uncle Leo, my uh, grandfather, must very industrious also, um, Uncle Leo was born premature, and uh, they used the first um, probably incubator in the country, which was actually a wood-fired stove with a little bit on the side to warm the food and keep it warm without burning it. And they put this premature baby into the wood-fired stove uh, to keep him warm. And it's successful because he's, uh, he's in his 70s now. Um, the, the issue is there was significant loss of land, significant loss of culture, significant economic, uh, uh, um, you know, um, dislocation and, you know, loss of economic, pla- you know, foundations. Uh, and that was ripe for all of those things I talked about before, which is, a, which is all those social um, dysfunction issues. And, and so when my mother and father uh, were raising this young family, myself and my sister, you know, I was visiting my... Um, my father in a place called Mount Eden Prison, which is a Raman prison in Auckland, and I was age three or four. And uh, of my uncles, there was most, you know, quite a number of them had been through prison. And um, that was one of many occasions I was seeing my father in prison. And, uh, and, it was, and what, what actually turned it was, because there, there, was, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of violence happening, um, was one evening my... Uh, my sister would have been about four or five uh, when this happened, was serving beers to the, all the uncles who come home from the pub two o'clock in the morning, you know, walking around and filling up all the beers. So my older sister was doing that, and my mother told her best friend who took, uh, uplifted us, uh, my sister, my mum, and myself, and lived, we lived in her home for 12 months in, uh, in, in Auckland before we were able to get out. Now, my mother also always says she would never have left if it was not for someone who loved and cared for her that came and grabbed her and took her away. So, now, the reason why I've sort of so laboured that a little bit, that's the back story. Um, how does that impact on me being here today and the likelihood or otherwise of me being here today? Well, you know, you carry this sense of being Māori um, when you're witnessing all these things um, and then further on my life, actually witnessing 
more. And, uh, you know, your, your view on being indigenous or being Māori was, you know, very blurred and, and distorted by, you know, these, all the this, this social issues that were going on. These are not cultural issues. These are not Māori issues. These are the product of being the poorest and the least educated and the most likely to be, you know, incarcerated. And so, you know, I carried that for a long time. And then you have the, the problem of uh, discrimination and prejudice that exists within our education system and our health system and our justice system. And, uh, you know, and that was really evidence for me because I actually, um, you know, I, I, I had very early on in life, you know, people at the principal and teachers in the schools I was going to identified me as a slow learner, a child with learning difficulties, a troubled child, a problem child. And no doubt if they had the medication now, they would probably have uh, medicated me with something like Ritalin and, uh, and, uh, and given me an, a title, a, a diagnosis. Um, but you know, when you get treated like that, it's, you really quickly conform to how you're being treated, right? And, uh, and so I was labeled the slow learning, uh, troublemaking kid and, and that followed me through from one school, like a primary school, junior school, through to intermediate school because the principal would do a handover to the, the, the new principal and say, oh, this is, these are the kids you have to look out for, you know? And it's generally the brown kids, right? And so you, you, you're doomed before you even have a chance to prove yourself. Now, why that's important is because, you know, that made me and my experience of education really poor and really, um, you know, unsatisfactory. And, and so what happened was, uh, you know, I, I was struggling to fit in at school and quickly you get disinterested and you're sitting at the back of the class when you get treated, you know, as a second-rate student and, and, and citizen, really. Um, and so I ended up... Uh, I ended up looking to where, you know, what, what I'd searched for, for lots of my life, was who was I as a Māori? Who was I as a Māori? My, my mother couldn't give that to me. And what I was seeing from my father's, uh, my experience with my father was not what I, I needed to see. And so, um, you know, I was associating with um, the cousins and all that and thinking that that was, you know, running with them was what, uh, what it was to be Māori. And, uh, you know, that was going to get me on, uh, um, into trouble real quick. Uh, it got us into trouble. We just didn't get called all the time. Um, and, and actually what happened um, when I was in secondary school was I, um, I, I got suspended from uh, the college. And then I got expelled from this college in Auckland. And uh, I can remember the shame of walking behind my mother on the way home from school after I'd just been expelled from this college. You know, it's meant to be the, the launching platform for my life as, a, as an adult uh, at secondary school. And uh, it was a lot of shame, you know, a lot of shame of, you know, of what, what had happened. And, um, you know, I know what that feeling is like to walk with your head down and behind, say, someone you love, knowing that you'd hurt them and you'd disappointed them. And also that you didn't reach a potential that, you know, maybe there was a little bit inside, despite all of that suffocation that had gone on uh, to date. So I, um, my, my mother took me home to, uh, to um, uh, home, and she sat me down and said, look, I'm going to send you down to live with your, your auntie, her mother, uh, sister, and uh, your, uh, her, his, her husband, who's Ngāti Porau, because she, he, he could perhaps, they could give you what I can't, which is your culture. So uh, are they, I left for Auckland and went to a place called Timaru, which is where my mother's from, south of Christchurch, and... I was, I was there, and, my, and the deal was if I behaved myself for the rest of the academic year, which is about 10 weeks, 12 weeks, uh, at, at a local school in Timaru, I was 14, uh, I'd be able to return to Auckland to a secondary school that said they'd take a chance on me, a school called Sacred Heart College. And anyway, I, uh, I got to Timaru, my grandmother put on her, her Sunday best, and a Catholic, good Catholic woman, took me along to a Presbyterian school, which is really hard. Catholic, well, you know, Catholic, staunch Catholic, taking me along to a Presbyterian school and asking if they could let me in. So this is Timaru Boys High. And uh, let me in for this period of 12 weeks. And it must have been my grandmother, my mother's mother, her charm that allowed this to happen. So I, uh, I went there 
and I uh, went to Timaru Boys High, and eight weeks later I got expelled. And uh, it was funny because it was uh, I, a few years back, uh, a journalist called Guy Espina did an article on me and, and in The Listener, and he, uh, he wrote about this story about being expelled from, from uh, Timaru Boys High. And the president of the Old Boys Association contacted Guyon and said, uh, Guyon, we have no evidence, no records of Lance O'Sullivan ever coming here. This was about 2014-15. And I'd w I won the New Zealand of the Year 2014. And I said to Guyon, no, no, I can understand this, Guyon, because they, they actually probably didn't want to be uh, known for uh, expelling the future New Zealand of the Year. <laughs> and uh, it was quite funny, because I rang the president and we cleared it up. I said, I remember getting expelled. But anyway, um, you, there was a big, there's a real big story between uh, then and now, right? So there's this whole sort of saga and this whole um, backstory of, of really doomed from the beginning and, you know, the chances of success and certainly standing in front of you this evening were just like zero. And um, what actually changed that was um, my mother brought me back to Auckland and she applied to two schools in Auckland, the only two that would actually even entertain interviewing or accepting an application. And um, I was successful in one of, of one of the schools, and the other one um, I wasn't, but and that school was called Hato Petera College, which is a, a Māori boarding school for Māori, a Catholic Māori boarding school for, for boys. And it was the, there in the first time in my life that I'd, I'd seen what it was to be Māori be proud, and, um, and aspire to be something more. So I went into the school and as a 15-year-old, head down, you know, no sense of pride or sense of self-belief, and I graduated with this amazing sense of um, belief that I could do anything, and importantly, a deep commitment that's, that started then and is, continues to this day to serve my people. Because... What I learned at what saved me, or at least gave me the opportunity to achieve my success and reach my potential, was realizing who I was as Māori. And it was my people then who were around me, and by extension, the people that are around me still, that gave me that opportunity. And so I have this huge sense of gratitude and a debt, a service, a sense of service to our people. And, you know, I, I practice a style of leadership now called servant leadership. And um, it's a, and servant leadership is uh, defined as uh, a conscious decision, uh, sorry, an inherent desire to serve, followed by a conscious desire to lead. So you're born with the desire to serve our people, our community, and, and learn the skills of leadership to achieve that. So that's what I do. And now, look, I'll tell you, and I, geez, I haven't even got past the first slide. How scary is that? Um, I'm going to get. I'm going to go. I'm going to get through this. Um, May Hunter made the mistake. He said, "Bro, you can talk as long as you want." I said, "Bro, big mistake." But um, the uh, um, so just quickly because there's young people in the crowd, right? And I just really want to reach out to them on this on this point. I'd finished school. I believed I could be anything in the world. People were telling me enough. If you tell them enough, it'll happen. And just go back to the other side. You know, up until that point. If you tell someone uh, often enough they're bad or dumb or poor or unhealthy, it will happen. The flip side to that, tell them often enough that they are great and that will happen. So I was being told I, was, I could be great. And so I didn't know what great looked like. I didn't know what that meant. What was, and I wanted to serve, so I didn't know what that looked like. But it happened one night when I was sitting at home uh, on Friday evening. I was 17. I was about to finish college. And an auntie of mine called me, my dad's sister. And she said, Neff, Neff, I want you to come with me to a hui. Uh, and I'm like on the phone, and I'm going, okay, auntie, um, it's sev I'm 17, it's a Friday night, I'm in Auckland, and you want me to come to a hui? And she goes, yes. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, um, where's that hui, auntie? And she said, uh, in Mangere at Mātātua Marae. So I was going, oh, it's Friday night, I'm 17. I'm sitting at home, and my auntie wants me to go to hui in Māngere in Mātātua Marae. What's it on? Oh, it's on Rungo Māori. And I said, okay. And I was thinking in my head, I'm 70 now. Um, and uh, so I went along to this hui, and it was on Rungo Māori, traditional Māori hearing. 
But uh, when we were at this hui, uh, this, this young Māori man stood up to speak, you know, really well-dressed, articulate in te reo Māori, our language, and in English. And he spoke for 45 minutes, and he talked about everything. That just, like, for 45 minutes, I was just captivated by this man. And at the end of it, uh, he, you know, I found out or he announced, you know, he was doctor, a Māori doctor. I'd never seen them before. For 45 minutes, he held my attention, and uh, I, I call him my 45-minute man, okay? And um, because I haven't ever been in the same room with him again. But he inspired me to a point that I always talk about him. I always talk about him. I know that he was critical in my, both my successes and the failures I may have had and the, the journey I've taken, but he was so important, yet uh, he was only in my life for 45 minutes. And so I often talk to young people and say, search out you know, for your 45-minute man or woman, someone who you, doesn't have to be in your life forever, but they will inspire you in a moment in time that will, will change your life and, you know, and blow your mind when you look back on it. And I'm so proud, you know, I reflect on that. And I spoke to this doctor a few years back, and it was so nice to connect, but I've never been in the same room with him again. So, young people at the back, oh, of course, in the front. Uh, yeah, you know, 45-minute man, 45-minute woman. Okay, now, let's get the speech started. <laughs> How to democratize healthcare. Okay. Actually, I want to just go to this. This was this evening, right? Matarua. Tipi, kei konei tonu? Kahori. Ao, ngā mihi ki a te kapo matarua. You know, he, 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 he tauira whakahihi mo tātou. And, um, you know, what's really awesome, does anyone pick what's really awesome in this picture? Yeah, yeah, the young girl in the front who, I don't know if everyone saw, but, you know, this table here was sitting and they were just doing the actions and it was awesome. It was so you know, warming to see the next generation being proud of their culture, being proud of their whanau, being proud of their mama, and um, knowing our culture like this and being in this warm and safe environment. I just thought that was awesome. The, the kapahaka was awesome, but that was the most poignant moment for me, just watching uh, that, yeah, those young girls. Now, so, so I'm, of course, uh, it's a digital health program. Okay, so has anyone heard about IMO? Yeah? Can you put your hand up? So, all right. All right. Okay, so it's a digital health program designed to democratize healthcare. Reese and I are doctors, and there's about 14,000 doctors in New Zealand. And I'd say about, well, actually, how many would fail our people, Reese? 9,000? I, I, I say 9,000. I say 5,000 is probably all we need, you know, to keep the good ones. And, um, you know, because, you know, the, the traditional model of healthcare is that you go and see a doctor who holds the power of, of life and death, literally, and the power to give health. And, you know, there's this real massive power imbalance, and I don't dig it, and I don't like it. And the reality is our people can do far more than they're given credit for. And actually, the people who deliver healthcare could be way different than, um, uh, than uh, what we currently have. So that we, have a, we have a digital health platform, and I'm going to talk to you about what it is, but it started in the far north of New Zealand, which is, which is up the top there, okay, where I'm from. It's uh, five hours north of Auckland. And so we look at all these, these problems, right? Haki haki, skin problems, Okay, at the very least, they cause uh, impaired learning, they cause uh, distracted child, but, you know, a problem here is also they end up getting uh, into the bone and into the joints and into the kidneys, and, and they can even uh, contribute to rheumatic fever, and I see some, I'm sure there's some whanau from Australia here, um, perhaps, is that right? Australia? Yeah. So, you know about this, you know? And... Um, you know, this is a problem, and it's in our community, I'm sure it's in Ōtaki, it's only our, our Māori or, or our Pacific Island children that have these problems predominantly. 
We have problems with dental infections and strep throat, which causes rheumatic fever, and, um, and, and kutu. These are the things that we deal with at the moment in, in this program called Aimoko. So what Aimoko does is we put technology, real simple technology, into schools, into koanga reo, into early childhood centres across the country, and we get the teacher aides or teacher assistants to do health assessments on children using this technology. Now, if you, you know, including uh, digital thermometers and scales and a thing to check your pulse. Now, if you could um, use Trade Me or Gumtree or eBay, you know, uh, you can use this. You know, it's easy. We train people to use it in two hours, and you can do a health assessment on a child in, in two minutes, and you send it to the cloud, okay? Now, in the cloud, we have a telehealth team that's based in the little town I'm from, in Kaitaia, that looks at all the cases and then they uh, send it off to a doctor to approve. So a doctor could be anywhere in the country or the world and do an, uh, approve a case for a child. Once that's done, a prescription for that child, like for medication, will go to a pharmacy or a chemist 100 metres down the road from where they are. Eight minutes after they were assessed by a teacher aide in their kuhanga reo, with a kaiafina or a teacher. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. This only happened about a week ago. This is Beryl Henare. She lives in Kaitaia, and she, um, she's the centre manager for ABC, which is an early childhood centre, and that's it there. It's opposite Pompalia Street a row, a School, and it's on uh, Dominion Road in Kaitaia. Beryl has been trained in to use some simple technology to do health assessments, right? So she did an assessment one day, and why is Beryl good? Because Beryl knows, just like uh, the parents of children, she knows when something's wrong with her ch uh, the children she cares for because they're usually active and they're usually um, you know, running around and stuff. And she'll know when something's wrong. And actually, so why, don't we, why do we make them come to see us in the clinic? Why don't we put services closer to them? So Beryl is what we call a, a digital health aide, a deputy, sorry, digital health deputy. Okay? This is our new term for this. It's a new role that didn't exist before we invented it, right? Now, so, so, um, so Beryl did this assessment on this young boy. He's a three-year-old Māori boy, high risk of having an admission into hospital for uh, skin infection because he's Māori and lives in, in Northland. And she described this, this, um, the, the grammar's a bit off, but <laughs> a sore on this child's left foot. She describes further in detail the fact that the child hadn't been walking during the morning, the lunchtime, and was feeling hot to touch. She actually did a temperature, which you can't show it here, but she did a temperature that's 37.9, and she repeated it um, later, and it was mildly low, but still a, still a high, sort of a low-grade temperature, a low-grade fever, in the context of a three-year-old child who had a sore, swollen ankle and had sores like haki haki and batigo around them, right? Then this is what the ankle looked like. Okay, so Beryl, who's done all this, at t one minute past two, Thursday the 20th of April, she did this assessment, right? She sent it off to a doctor, who happened to be me, and I took, checked this case, actually on the, on the flight from Kai Auckland to Kai Tire, I was checking my phone, because on that, on that flight, you can actually um, use your phone, because it's so old, it doesn't have enough technology. To be, to be interfered with by my phone. But I was flying over the Kaipara Harbour north of Auckland when we were sorting out this kid. And um, Beryl also, just picture this, believe this, Beryl also did a video of the child. Now, Reese, you know, the clinicians in the room, is there other clinicians or nurses or doctors? Okay, I mean, yeah. Is anyone, is that Moy? Kia ora, Moy. Um, is there anyone who thinks this is a problem? Or should I ask, is there anyone who doesn't think this is a problem? Māori child, limping, painful, swollen ankle with a low grade temperature? You don't have to be a doctor, right? To realise this is a problem. But up until now, you have to go to a doctor's surgery to get the treatment for it. Well, we actually, um, I was on a, just imagine this, picture this. I was on a plane, and I clicked a button, 
and a referral went to the local hospital for this child to go directly to hospital. And I hadn't even seen this child. Just picture it was eight minutes after this child had been assessed by Beryl, okay? And this child ends up in hospital on intravenous antibiotics with the nana holding the child. We did an x-ray to make sure that this wasn't really deep into the bone, which is really common. The only children who get bone-related infections in my neck of the woods, which I'm sure is the same in, in Ngāti Raukawa, are Māori children. So we do an x-ray. Thankfully, that x-ray is normal. Um, so that's, this is a really good example of democratising healthcare and getting access to healthcare for our people sooner and having our people drive um, health service delivery. And, and I'll, get, I'll tell you, one thing I didn't tell you about the story is um, this child's parents actually had taken them to a local doctor's. The same story you all believe was wrong, there's something wrong with this kid. They'd taken them to see a, a local doctor's surgery and they'd sent them home. So needless to say, I got off the plane, I, I rang up the clinic the next day and gave the guy, my, um, the, the person who saw this patient, uh, my opinion, which is pretty harsh. Um, but my protest at this, is at this uh, what's happening to our people, and no, I dare say it's happening to our indigenous people elsewhere in the, in the world, my protest is to find a smart solution to make 9,000 doctors or 10,000 nurses irrelevant. You know, we've spent decades trying to make them culturally competent, eh, Reese? We've spent decades trying to make them culturally competent to be responsive to the needs of our people. I addressed an audience like this a while back, about 350, and there's a whole lot of nurses and doctors in the audience, and I said, you know, we're actually over trying to teach you to be more competent. We're going to make you irrelevant. You know, because then all of a sudden we're going to grow a workforce of digitally enabled people who can provide better care than you can. More culturally competent care, more quality, you know, clinically competent, you would argue, right, Reese? And, um, well, that's interesting. At the back of the room, if this is that same meeting, one of these people at the back was a, a nurse, a doctor saying, a South African doctor trained in the UK working in Blenheim. Sounds like a joke, eh? <laughs> Actually, there's another joke I had recently. An Englishman, what is it? An Englishman, an Australian, and a Canadian. It's an interesting joke. I'll share it with Reese um, sometime. <laughs> I'm, I'm describing a part of our health leadership of one of our illustrious uh, uh, health organisations in New Zealand. Narrows it down, eh, Reese? Um, actually, I'll tell you what, it's, um, I, was dis I, was, uh, I was describing, you know, we're actually moving this program around New Zealand. There's seven, six and a half thousand children in over 110 sites across New Zealand who have access to digital health program. Picture this, we have a child who's going to get assessed in Gisborne, uh, you know, tomorrow morning, two minutes later, a 20-year-old girl who works in our office who three years ago was at Kaitai College, has no medical training, no IT training, no degree actually, but she actually diagnoses things in this office in Kaitai. She's part of a digital health team. She's a, she is a digital health worker that didn't exist five years ago when we started this. And she's diagnosing something and sending it to me, and uh, I'll, I'll approve it in a meeting in Wellington tomorrow, and two minutes later it's going to a child's pharmacy in Gisborne, eight minutes after being seen. Delivering health care in seconds and minutes rather than hours and days. Now, um, <laughs> jing, 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 jing. Oh, jing. Oh. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, right? Because so I, I talk about disruption. So I talked about uh, servant leadership, but there's also the style of leadership that I also adopt. It's just disruptive leadership, you know? Disruptive technology, disruptive innovation. And importantly, I was at an, I was at a, an event this morning where we were talking about technology and inequalities or inequities, right? And, you know, the risk for us is if we don't get at the front of this stuff, if we don't get at the front of the emerging, converging technologies and the exponential technologies that are really going to redesign the health system, our people, the gaps will grow wider, the haves will have greater access to health care than the have-nots. And um, really evidenced by the fact that 
you know, we were moving around the country and I got a phone call from a district health board, which is a big organisation that looks after your health care, right? Oh, look, we're just ringing to say we hear you're coming into our region. And I said, yeah, that's right, yep, yep. Um, so uh, this is not a phone call to say don't come in, you know, not trying to say keep out. It's just a phone call to say how we could work together. But really it was a phone call to say don't come in. You know, and I said, oh, no, it's cool. We'll catch up and talk about it. Um, so we had a meeting, and uh, they said, look, we won't fund you to come in here because we're already developing our own digital health platform. We've uh, got this from uh, uh, the United States. I said, oh, okay, cool, cool. Um, that's cool. Well, we're going to come in here anyway. Um, you know, that's that Maui Portiki cheeky, uh, no, don't give a stuff attitude. And, um, you know, and, they, and, they, and I showed them what we're doing, and told them, look, we're going to come in here anyway. Um, and they, they looked at what we're doing. They, I showed them all this. And actually, I showed them one of a case from their own community, just like this. And they said, oh, we could probably do that, you know. This is what they told me. I said, oh, really? Really? Um, well, I'll tell you this. From my understanding, uh, we spent 2.3 cents for every dollar you spent on your system. And, we, and you're telling me that you could probably do what we're doing? We spent less than three cents for every dollar they spent, and they told us they could probably do what we're doing. I thought, well, what's going to happen when we spend 10 cents in every dollar, or 20 cents? So, the disrupt, you know, like, what's, what's really, I think, for me is, you know, what happens if we got a European or an American platform come into New Zealand to deliver digital health care to New Zealanders? Where does equity fe feature on that, um, that, that company's priori list of priorities? Well, actually, I believe it's going to make it's going to make it easier for people already to get access to care to get great access to care, and those that already have trouble getting access to care, they'll have more trouble. So, this is where I'm at at the moment. This is um, this is what I'm doing, and uh, so I don't do a lot of clinical medicine now. I put down the stethoscope and picked up the tools of innovation, tools of disruption to make a change. And it's exciting, to be honest, you know, my career as a doctor, this is the only time I've really felt that we can change things, redesign things so that it's way different. You know, throw what we do out and um, really put pressure on the incumbent providers to actually shape up or ship out. So um, it's exciting, I just think I'll go through my last slide. Okay, and actually if there's any questions, Mayana, we could take a few questions, five minutes. but. This is my final slide, and this is a slide of three indigenous Māori children who live about 40 kilometres where, my, where I live. And I was out doing a visit one night, a home visit, and these kids come up to me because they saw our car with our logos and stuff on it. And they come up to me and said, are you with the Aimoko team? And I said, yep, yep, I am. Why is that? They didn't know who I was, okay? Now, I can appreciate they're young, and that was good. You know, they didn't know who I was. I was their local doctor. <laughs> but they didn't know who I was. I was invisible to them. I just want you to hold on to that, okay? I said to them, yeah, how did, why did, what do you know about Aimoko? And they said, oh, three weeks ago, we had, I had all these sores, and this young boy showed me his legs. I had all these sores all over my legs, and uh, uh, I went and saw Fire Lisa. And Fire Lisa is a term of endearment for uh, the teacher aide who works in this ch child's school. And Fire Lisa... Uh, he said, look, Fire Lisa used the iMoko iPad and I got better. Now, why that's really awesome is, one, I was invisible. The medical workforce was invisible. I, was a, I signed off his prescription on my phone, but he didn't even know I'd done that and he didn't care. And I don't care, because he got better. Two, he saw Fire Lisa as the person who delivered his health care. And I think that's far more valuable than me giving kudos and credit for, credit, uh, credit for that. And the final thing is he saw an iPad and I, you know, device as something more than just movies and games and music. He saw it as a way to access healthcare. So that's really cool. And it access it in his school, you know. And the child got the antibiotics delivered, in this case, on the rural delivery the next day. I went and saw his father and he said, it was awesome, just turns up. Cheered it around the whanau. She, she. <laughs> that part I didn't like so much, but 
child got better. That's the main thing. So, look, you know, I guess I gave a long story to tell you where I, my backstory, but it's important to know, for you to know, and probably less for, for this audience to know than for many of the other audiences I speak to, but to know the reason I do this is the same as what you're doing in your, in your communities. And the deep sense of uh, service and commitment to our people. But it has to be, we have to be smart. We have to think up new things before other people have thought them up. We have to look at new, new ways of doing things, fail fast, learn quickly, you know, just testing things. You know, and so we're in a really exciting uh, cusp of, of for what we're doing. Our vision is actually that 500,000 children will have access to a digital health program by 2020. By the time We Cookie goes, we cookie goes up to uh, Hawaii, half a million children will have access to a digital health program from zero to 18. And that's just looking at children on this age group. And then we're looking, and we're looking at you know, respiratory problems and joint problems and screening and a whole lot of stuff run by our communities who are far better to look after the health of our people. So I just want to say uh, kia ora to everyone, especially those funders, you know, investors. <laughs> nah, it's, um, it's very cool. It's, it's very cool. We, um, I hope that we can take this further than, uh, than Aotearoa, and we're looking at those opportunities now. But anyway, hurino kia koutou anoa ngā mihi, kia koutou rauranga tira mā mō tēnei honore, kua tāi mai ahau, uh, I tēnei pō. A tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou katoa.